Welcome you all in this first session of the last day's conference. Um, today, we have the pleasure and it's a great honor to all of us. We have Jonathan Harrington with us. It's one, he's one of our legends in phonetics and he has been doing so many things and it's impossible to describe, but I would say uh, segmental phonetics, quarticulation, sound change. But Jonathan has not left aside prosody and intonation. So I would say that it is a good representation of the state of the art of phonetics. Well, welcome, Jonathan, and I leave the floor to you, please. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that very kind introduction, Antonis, and um, thank you also for um, inviting me. Um, I'd of course have very much like to have seen you in um, Athens, but this is this is this will have to be the next best thing. So uh, before um, I get started, I would like to um, acknowledge the um, help of my uh, colleagues um, on this um, ERC project that is from. Um, Johanna Kronenberg, Felicitas Kleber, Michele Gubian, Pia Greca, and um, Leda Kapia. So this is very much a um, collaborative effort. Um, what I am going to do is to um, give you a um, snapshot of the um, sorts of things which we are thinking about um, at the moment on this um, ERC project. Um, and um, what I uh, want to do is to start out by saying something about the um, relationship between phonetic variation and sound change. Now, it's... Um, probably true to say that um, almost um, all sound change arises from shifts in um, 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 time dependent phonetic variation. So um, what I mean by that is that um, it's usually then some events in um, 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 time after X or before X, which causes then in the um, long-term X to um, change. So if we think about um, synchronic variation, this is um, everyday variation in, um, um, very many languages. And so uh, we um, um, find, for example, that um, vowels are nasalized before nasal consonants. So the a ah, then in a word like man is um, nasalized because of the n. There is the um, well-known finding of um, VCV articulation. So then where um, V2 um, influences V1 and um, vice versa. Uh, we um, also find in um, lots of different languages that um, synchronically, um, it's um, very difficult indeed to um, make the transition from a nasal consonant to a following fricative without also 
producing an intermediate um, oral stop. And of course, that's then um, why um, words like um, mints and mints or um, 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 sense, S-E-N-S-E, -E, and sense as in um, cents and dollars are um, homophones. And uh, there, is, there is then the um, very well-known finding from uh, prosody research that um, the fundamental frequency starts um, 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 higher after um, voiceless than, than um, after voice stops. <clears throat> and so these then are um, synchronic processes which are um, associated then with some very well-known sound changes. So the um, derivation then, for example, of the um, 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 French main from Latin manus, where there were um, 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 only um, oral vowels, links then uh, this and this, or um, umlaut then in uh, German. So we have fuse with a um, um, high front vowel um, from what was um, originally a back vowel in uh, Fortis. And then um, sound changes like the um, surname Thompson with a P, uh, which was obviously derived from the son of Tom and not from the son of Tomp is um, 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 obviously then has um, something something to do with this um, synchronic variation and tonogenesis then in Southeast Asian languages um, are um, linked then to this um, synchronic change. So that's what this um, relationship is here. So uh, the um, issue then is um, how then um, should we, if we want then as it, it is um, one of, one of um, our um, 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 aims then is to build a cognitive computational model of sound change. Um, how then um, should we um, um, build such a model? So we can um, start out then by um, making um, um, two um, observations here. Um, first of all, that there is um, variation both between and within individuals in um, how speech sounds are coordinated in production and, um, um, and passed in perception. So there are, for example, some speakers who um, minimally uh, co-articulate their speech sounds. And then there are also some for, for um, 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 whom co-articulation is uh, considerable. And um, sound change is uh, really then just, it's, um, it's, it's, it's an, um, extension of this okay so this is this is this is what happens synchronically and in its extreme form we get um sound change so the um idea then is that if we can build a model to explain time dependent phonetic variation that is from here to here, well then we can um, adapt such a model to um, explain sound change because 
sound change is what um, 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 happens then when this type of variation becomes um, extreme. So um, if uh, this is so, what then are the requirements of such a model? And there are two things here. First of all, of course, we um, need a database of phonetic variation, which is um, relevant then to sound change. And this is then um, often, for example, one with um, older speakers and with um, and younger speakers or um, regional differences, i.e. a uh, database which is um, linked then to sound change or um, sound change in progress. And then uh, we um, need then a um, model of time-dependent phonetic variation, which is characteristic of this database, but which um, um, also then situates individual utterances by specific speakers as points in such a space whose um, axes are informative about such variation. And that's what I want to talk about now. We can um, build this kind of model with a technique called functional principle components analysis, um, FPCA for short. And two um, important advantages of um, FPCA is, um, first of all, there is uh, no need for Subsegmentation, and this is um, very important, of course, when we um, analyze speech, because 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 we all know how hard it is to segment, for example, a diphthong into its uh, component parts, or or to find um, 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 and vowel targets, um, and so on. And then with um, FPCA, it can um, um, also um, handle multiple signals. And um, this is um, very important indeed in um, phonetic analysis, because of course we um, know, for example, in um, analyzing vowels that the uh, difference between say E and E depends um, not only on the first form and frequency, but also the second form and frequency. And we would then um, like some model which can uh, take account of these things at the um, same time. So uh, what I'm going to present you now is actually with um, um, two um, kinds of um, analyses, the um, first of which has um, nothing to do with sound change. It's actually um, intonation, but, but it's, it's um, useful because it, it can be used then to um, illustrate the properties of um, FPCA. And then I will talk about a type of sound change, which is called um, metaphony, which um, 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 takes place in the um, um, southern um, Italian varieties, and it's um, derived then from um, VC, VCV 
co-articulation, um, rather like um, <clears throat> form that. Okay, so we'll uh, plunge into the um, first of these then, and the uh, this is actually um, Albanian because um, Albanian is uh, part of our ERC project. It's an um, under studied language, um, and it's very interesting from um, lots of points of view. It is a pitch, ac pitch accent language, so that as in Germanic languages, uh, words are um, accented when a pitch accent is aligned with the syllable that has primary lexical stress. And uh, what I want to um, focus on then is the um, alignment in um, um, broad and um, narrow focus context, uh, because in um, Albania, Is that okay now? Uh, there is a problem with the sound. I'm trying. Uh, can you try again, please? Yes, that's okay, fine. Okay, no, now it's now. fine. It's I, okay. I will mute my face. Hello. Uh, Patricia, I cannot mute you. Please mute your microphone. Okay, please continue. Is it okay now? Fine. Okay. So that um, there are um, alignment differences then when the um, word is in a narrowly versus broadly focused context. And so um, what, 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 what we wanted to do then was to uh, use FPCA to uh, see if this was so in a database with um, sonorant words like Lena um, that had been produced by 21 um, L1 Albanian speakers. So if you just look at all of the um, fundamental frequency contours for the um, broad focus context, which are in green, and the narrow focus contents, which are in purple, um, it's um, a bit of a mess, isn't it, really? Because it's not sort of really clear to see. I mean, there is some um, indication of a peak here. There may be one here. Notice that this would um, also be extremely difficult to um, segment. I mean, where? Where, for example, are you going to place the uh, target in a contour like this? Is it sort of here or is it down here, et cetera? And this is one of the very good things about um, FPCA, which is that we don't um, have to do that. So um, FPCA is a data-driven technique, which means that we just uh, provide it in the um, first instance with the fundamental frequency contours, and importantly, with um, 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 no um, category information, so that it knows um, nothing about um, um, broad versus narrow focus, or which contour was produced by which speaker, et cetera, et cetera. It just then has this um, tangle of um, lines. Then um, FPCA um, produces what are called PCs, which will um, provide us with some underlying time-varying shapes, which are characteristic of the whole 
database, and then also PC scores, which is where each of these um, signals becomes a point then in the um, FPCA space. And once we have done this bit here, then we can supply the category labels, build a statistical model, and then we can identify the time varying shapes then for the two categories. This then is the um, first part where we get the principal components and the um, black line, which is the same here, by the way, as here, as it is here, it just looks different. It's an um, optical illusion, but it's actually the same. And this is the um, mean fundamental frequency across all of the contours in this database. So that part has um, nothing at all to do with FPCA. Well, what we then see here is that the is that PC1 says there is variation here so that so that there are um, lots of contours that have broadly the same shape, but some have a higher fundamental frequency and some have a lower fundamental frequency, which is, of course, what, what we'd expect because you have some speakers with high-pitched voices and some with um, low-pitched voices. What it then says is that there is a PC2, which um, has identified that there are some contours with an early peak, which is here, and that there are some with a late peak, and then also that there are some contours then, which have a fundamental frequency peak, and there are some then that have a fundamental frequency trough. As I said, what um, FPCA does then is it will um, turn each of these contours into a point here in an um, um, FPCA space, so that this green contour here is actually this point here in the S1, S2 space. These then are weightings on these PCs. So it says that this green contour is at minus 3.4, which will be down here somewhere. This means that it is um, near the mean and slightly above it. And this means that it is very much at the mean um, itself. So this is the very good thing about this technique, which is that we get information about the global characteristics then of the database and then and then each of these is a um, 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 point in the um, F PCA space. Now that we've done this and this, now we can supply the category labels. So um, green, green then is for um, uh, broad focus, purple is for um, narrow focus. You can see here then that the um, S1, which is PC1, is, is not that useful really for um, distinguishing between broad and narrow focus, but um, PC2 is, so we select that. We run then a statistical test, like a mixed model. 
So this then uh, says if these are significantly different, which they are, and then we can um, use the means then from this test to reconstruct the um, average contours then here then based on PC2 for um, broad and um, narrow focus. So what that means then is that with um, FPCA, we have gone then from the tangle on the left to this here on the right-hand side. So what I'm going to do now, I see I only have about four or five or six or seven minutes or something left. So I'll work through this um, fairly quickly. So this then is now about um, metaphony in, in the um, Lasberg region of um, southern Italy, which is um, located here. And what that does then is um, metaphony then Is it okay? Yeah, hello. Can you hear me still? Yeah, 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 it's fine. Okay, fine, right. Sorry, it's just that I got some, yeah. Okay, so um, metaphony then is where the um, information in the suffix vowel is uh, transferred then to the stem vowel so that in standard Italian, we um, have belle, belli, but in the um, Lasberg area, we have bell and bill, um, maybe then also with the deletion of the suffix, or we have in standard Italian, we have grossa, grosso, but in um, Lasberg, we have gross and gruss, the um, um, or, or is an um, 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 U in um, Lausberg. And there are um, various studies of um, metaphony which have um, suggested that it is a three stage process of raising, diphthongization, and then further raising so that. We start out then, and this is the uh, progression then of the sound change. So we start out then with, um, for example, grossa, grossu, and then grossu becomes grossu. This is the influence then of this um, high vowel on, on the stem vowel. And then, we go from grosso to grosso. So actually where this or becomes an war and then from or to u. Now these um, separate stages are uh, thought to be characteristic of these three um, regions here. So that's of Mormano, which is an um, isolated village in the um, mountains of um, Lausberg has gone this far on the west coast it has gone this far and on the east coast it has gone this far so um, what what we want to find out is then is there any um, evidence then for a progression such that the um, metaphonic strength is, greatest in three, least in one, and intermediate in two. And that actually would be a um, very interesting finding because what it would um, suggest then is that before you go from or to u, which is of course just a, just a um, raising then of the vowel, you um, pass through this, um, diphthongization stage. So the um, analysis was 
uh, based this time on FPCA applied to the first two formants, F1 and F2 of the initial vowel in the stem um, of almost 3,000 vowels from 35 speakers distributed across these three regions for uh, 30 stem pairs, uh, which were then in words like um, 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 this. So uh, what do we find then? We'll um, focus then on uh, PC1 and PC3. So these then are these characteristics across this whole database. So what we find then is that there is um, variation between a low F1 and low F2 and a higher F1 and higher F2, which is of course characteristic then of the um, shift from O to U from red where F1 and F2 are high to blue U, which is where they are low. This is, um, this is a bit more complicated because what this actually suggests is that there is indeed diphthongization in this database from where, can you see from where F, F, F2 and F1 are both low, right, to where F2 and F1 become high. So this is then like from U to O, and blue is then from O to U, right? So this actually shows there is diphthongization. This shows then that there is vowel um, raising. If we then uh, plot these vowels in the um, space of S1 and S3, so that's the um, raising and diphthongization, what do we find? We find that on the um, 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 East Coast that there is a very, very good separation between the um, metaphonic vowel, so that's like grus, and the non-metaphonic vowel gros, whereas in Momano they are sort of, they're very slightly separated, but not that much. And what's most interesting is that on the West Coast, they are halfway between this and this. Now this is um, very important because when you look at the West Coast compared with Bormano and the, and the East Coast, what do you find? You find that in the metaphonic case, there is indeed diphthongization. Can you see that here? Because this shifts from here up to here, whereas here and here it's actually fairly monothongal. So that that has therefore demonstrated that to get from this conservative region here where there is not much of a um, metaphonic effect, to the east coast where there is a big metaphonic effect, we also pass through this um, intermediary stage of diphthongization. And um, not only that, but we can also see that there is um, enhancement here then in the um, in non um, metaphonic context. And that's, this is now my very last slide, which is, this is um, thinking then, um, about where um, FPCA fits into a cognitive model of processing speech. So, and this is um, thinking then um, in terms of um, exemplar theory, which um, says then that we um, memorize um, episodes of speech. And that there is, and and that we then derive categorical phonological 
information from these um, episodes of speech, but it has um, never really been clear to me how then, how we um, incorporate um, 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 time varying information to get from um, memorized um, episodes of speech to uh, phonological categories. And I would um, suggest then that um, people do obviously not exactly what I have demonstrated with um, FPCA, but actually something which is um, analogous to it, which is that they work out then from their um, memorized um, episodes, what the principal axes of um, um, time varying information are, and that that can then um, also be used for classification purposes in um, speech perception. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, please raise your hand for any questions. Professor Botinis. Ah. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. I mean, we could discuss the whole afternoon. Yes. Uh, but I take some specific and then I go to a bit more general. Uh, the, spe the specific is this focus in Albanian. Yes. It's very interesting to see that when you have early focus, you have an abrupt rise, uh, probably, if we could see the signal, at the beginning to the middle of the vowel, mm -hmm. right? You have an abrupt rise. Yeah. The situation is very similar in Greek. Yes. Yes, but right. And uh, right. So, so I had uh, thought about Greek and um, it is. But I think it might also be very slightly different because the default in the um, broad focus case in Albanian is a um, late rise. Okay, so the so that in um, Albanian, in a you know neutral context, um, Albanians have late. Um, fundamental frequency peaks, which is which is um, the opposite, for example, of what you tend to find in um, standard German or many um, varieties of English. Well, yes, but here we have um, a question. When you have narrow focus, yes. usually it is one lexical item under focus. So mm -hmm. the, the domain of the focus application is restricted. And yeah. then you have to go up there. If you have broad focus, mm -hmm. then the domain is much larger. Mm -hmm. Which means, let's say, in narrow focus, the first word is focused. If you have a broad focus, you have a couple of three words, faction, lexical. And in the last, the latter case, you don't have focus on the first lexical item. It's the whole thing. Yes, yes, but, so, but yeah, I know. But I mean, even, even, even in a, um, broad focus context, you will still usually find, at least in um, English and in 
German, a uh, pitch peak, i.e. Uh, um, high star tone, on the nuclear um, accented syllable, right? So that, so that, so that if I said an um, out of the blue sentence like, um, um, John is visiting Athens, John is visiting Athens or something like that. I mean, this would then be in response to, um, so what's um, happening? Well, then you would still find a fundamental frequency peak on the A uh, of um, Athens, right? And in a um, um, narrow focus context, you would find, at least in um, English and in German, you would find the same kind of thing, but it would be a larger peak and it might even be a um, um, delayed peak. Now in Albanian, in the broad focus context, you actually have a late peak, a uh, delayed peak, and in the broad focus context, you have um, you sorry in the narrow focus context you have a um, um, peak in the middle of the vowel, and in a broad focus context it's late. So it's exactly the precisely. opposite. Precisely. Yes. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. Precisely. Okay. <laughs> so you have a distinction there. That yes. was my specific question. And then I have a general question in between. If somebody else wants to talk, Athena, um, are we have, do we have any hands? Uh, not yet. Not uh, yet. Okay. When we speak, uh, when we talk, Jonathan, people might yeah, ask, yeah. might start asking. Okay. Yeah. About this sound change, well, we've been thinking and thinking and thinking. I have a student of mine, a PhD, a former one, and he says that a lot of those things and questions will be solved by probability models and artificial intelligence and all those things. Uh, because if we consider, if we think classical Greek and then later Greek or modern Greek, uh, the diphthongs, the, the ancient diphthongs, they all start from lower vowels towards higher vowels the front high vowel. Mm -hmm. Well, we may say it's a simple ru rule. All vowels have one direction. We don't have bi-direction uh, diphthongs. Mm. Uh, we don't have falling diphthongs. We have only rising. My students have been asking me. And I, my simple question is, me, my simple answer is this. It's because the language likes it this way. Uh, most of the time, or I should ask, is it, we can observe the rule, but we cannot explain why those things happen. I mean, it's language itself which decides how things are going to change. There is no natural, no natural uh, explanation, so to say. Uh, things okay. may go the opposite ways. The opposite ways. Well, they may well do. I, I, I don't. I mean, I um, agree that mm, you can have uh, two languages, for example, where which are broadly similar, similar and where you get a um, sound change in one, but not in the um, other, right? So that in, so that um, 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 English, for example, has lost its um, initial um, velar stops, whereas German 
has not. So you have uh, Knorten in um, 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 German, but you have not in um, English. So that so that actually shows that there is a random and probabilistic um, aspect then to the direction in which um, sound change may um, take place. But uh, just because it is um, probabilistic doesn't mean to say that we can't seek to um, understand and model um, what is going on, right? So that sure, sure. So that so that so that um, um, one of the things then is the um, constraints on what the um, vocal track can do, what the um, 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 hearing system can um, um, resolve as well. And these are, for example, some of the reasons um, why you find that sound change is directional in um, many languages, so that so that um, so that so that there are um, lots of languages in the um, world where um, high back vowels front, but there are very very few where high front vowels retract, and that's all to do with then the um, mechanisms of the vocal tract and its relationship to uh, the acoustic waveform and the um, um, hearing resolution as well. And then the um, next thing, which is tractable and um, important is um, who speaks to whom, right? So that so that we have um, lots of evidence, for example, that when we um, engage in dialogue, that we um, imitate each other. There are there are um, loads of experiments now which have uh, demonstrated that. So that imitation or the longer term accumulation of imitation is one of the things then which um, 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 drives sound change. So that um, migration, for example, plays a, plays a large part as well in um, whether or not sound change will take place, as of course does um, isolation. So, I mean, if you isolate a group of speakers, as of course um, happened in colonial times in the um, Americas and, and um, Australasia, then because these people are isolated, then they will form their own um, accent and maybe actually even then their own um, language. So the um, thing is that yes, um, sound change is probabilistic, um, um, very, very much so, but that um, doesn't mean that we can't build a tractable computational model to um, explain it. I mean, if, if we um, know then um, something about the phonetic and phonological and 
lexical characteristics of the um, speakers who are likely to um, interact with each other, then uh, we actually um, can predict the um, direction um, of sound change. So um, I don't really, um, this um, idea that um, language, language as it were, um, um, makes up its own mind about whether or not it should <laughs> change is, is not really quite right. It's sort of um, more that um, more that uh, there is a complex relationship between um, language as a system and the individuals who make use of language, right? I mean, the um, analogy which is, um, which was first used by um, Limblom in um, 1984 here is, is a, um, a very um, useful one, I think, which is that, which is that if you look at um, uh, um, termite nests, okay, they, they, they have the most astonishing um, cathedral-like structure with um, arches and with, you know, peaks. Now, um, do you think that a termite has a blueprint um, of, of this cathedral-like structure in its uh, um, brain? Well, um, um, obviously not. Okay, so of course then the issue is, okay, fine. Well then, um, where do these um, cathedral-like structures actually come from? And they come from how the termites um, interact with each other, right? And it's, and it's not quite the same thing, but it's a similar thing in um, language then, which is that um, phonological structure and morphological structure are, are emergent consequences of how individuals um, interact with each other. So of course, if then we can um, build a model of interaction, well, that of course then um, means that um, we can understand um, not only something about the relationship between this very um, complex set of signs, i.e. phonological signs and um, everyday um, usage of speech, but we can also uh, use that same model to predict phonological change. That was a very long answer, but of course, it's a long answer because it's a complicated question. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, we are lucky because I must say now we have recorded you and we will have this recording to remember your talk. Okay. I mean, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. All right. Well, Thank you for inviting me. It was... Bye-bye. Um,